very appreciative of the issues you've been dealing with this morning. Uh, oddly enough, this bill uh, is somewhat of the same type. We are talking about protecting our agricultural, uh, agricultural heritage here in New Mexico. Uh, a lot of farms, uh, a lot of water issues. Uh, all of these get touched on by this bill. Again, as Senator Sewell's mentioned, we're not talking about banning hydraulic, fra hydraulic fracturing throughout the state of New Mexico. We're talking about keeping it in the two major basins where it's actually going on and preventing its encroachment into these rich agricultural areas where uh, a lot of our pristine watersheds and pristine lands and the remaining pristine water we have is going on. Um, first, to be clear, also, when we're talking about hydraulic <coughs> fracturing of today, we're not talking about the hydraulic fracturing that was developed in 1947. It was a much simpler process, much lower pressure, much lower horsepower required on the pumps. Um, it wasn't slick water fracturing. You know, now we're adding a lot of chemicals to the fluids. Um, these chemicals are friction reducers to get the high volume, high pressure in the laterals and the horizontals. We're only talking about horizontal hydraulic fracturing. I'm going to bring some of what's in those fluids to your attention. Uh, one of the main concerns we've heard about the benzenes, the diesel fluids that have been used in the past. Uh, one of the main concerns now is the presence of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are chemicals that are so toxic there is no safe dose for them. In fact, the lower doses turn out to be more toxic, uh, causing endocrine driven diseases. So, again, that's pretty much the background on the bill. Um, the best handout to look at to start is this map that I've handed out that shows uh, the main areas where fracturing is going on. This is based on data self reported to industry by Frac Focus. Um, starting in the upper left hand corner, uh, I have that labeled as the San Juan Basin, 336 fractured wells here. Most of my data is 2011-2012 added together. Uh, that was the easiest way. That's, those are the two years for which we have the best hydraulic fracturing data available. So again, in the north, upper northwest corner of the state, 336 fractured wells. Uh, working your way around clockwise up in the Raton Basin you see up there, <coughs> Colfax County. Uh, 29 fractured wells in the Raton Basin, moving around the uh, 21 fractured wells in Hardin County, and then as you're in the lower southeast corner of the state, that's really where all the hydraulic fracturing is going on. 691 fractured wells in the last two years uh, in the Permian Basin, and then apparently a fractured well in Grant County in the southwest uh, corner of the state. I'm not sure what that one was about, but to summarize this map, what's really going on is 95% of all hydraulic fracturing going on in the state is happening in the two basins that are being exempted from this fracturing ban. So again, in acknowledgement and respect that this state is highly dependent on revenues from the oil and gas industry, we recognize that. I think that's a very dangerous position economically to be so dependent on a finite resource that is in fact in its last uh, in its end days here, that's what hydraulic fracturing is about. This is the end days of oil and gas, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But in acknowledgement that we are still financially dependent, those two areas exempted. So this bill, over the last two years, had this been in place in 2011 and 2012, this bill would have prevented about 50 wells from being drilled in practice. So we are talking about a fairly minor impact. That's about 2% of all the wells that were drilled. The next thing I want to direct your attention to is this pie chart that I've made of spills in the oil and gas industry. You don't even have to use advanced uh, extraction techniques like hydraulic fracturing to get accidents in the oil and gas field. And I do want to say, as I present this information, uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of energy engineers in New Mexico. I have the highest respect for especially the petroleum engineers that go through very rigorous training, mostly at New Mexico Tech and other universities and uh, excellent engineering crews we have. Nonetheless, there are accidents and there are mistakes in the, in the oil patch. Um, this, uh, this is based on a, a wonderful database that's now available at the New Mexico Oil Conservation Division. Um, it's called the, uh, the Spills Database. I think it's labeled spills.aspx if you want to look it up, but it's on their website. All this data is downloadable. These are self-reported primarily, but they're also some of them were found by compliance inspectors. But please look at the numbers for 2011 and 2012, 1,498, just about 1,500 spill events in two years. Um, 4.6 million gallons of fluids released, uh, primarily produced water. Uh, there was quite a bit, 666,000 gallons of crude oil also spilled, a number of other fluids, including drilling fluids. My point on the spills is primarily this. 
again, hydraulic fracturing, especially slick water hydraulic fracturing, what's going on now, is allowing the oil and gas industry to move from the corners of the state toward the center of the state. This is opening up new regions, and it's using new and more toxic chemicals. And those two things together present the primary threat to water and watersheds in New Mexico. So that's all we're talking about is because it's more dangerous, because we have millions of gallons of fluid spilled already in the oil and gas industry, we want to contain that to the corners of the state where, where it's already taking place and not allowing it to expand into our pristine lands. So um, these oil and gas spills get reported on these. Again, I said these are mostly stuff reported as a release notification. All these are available for download online. But this is basically a summary of the information. Of all these spills, the 1,500 spills, at least 30 of them were spills involving a waterway or groundwater. So the issue of has, have waterways and groundwater been contaminated and been affected? The answer is yes. 30 examples of it here in the last two years, um, and certainly quite a few spill events. That's uh, the number one, th this is the number one reason, uh, the first of five reasons that I'm going to give you why I believe we should ban hydraulic fracturing. I believe it should be banned everywhere, by the way, but again, we're not biting off, we're not biting off that today. Um, the second issue of hydraulic fracturing I'd like to bring up, uh, this is not based on, I don't have a handout for this for you, but I do want to address the issues of water consumption. Um, I know the Senate Conservation Committee has been dealing with some very, very serious testimony about the drought in New Mexico and other places around the southwest this year. I remember some numbers, 93% of the state in a severe drought. Um, rainfall certainly uh, at some of its lowest levels over the past two years. The past two year totals on rainfall are some of the lowest in history ever recorded in New Mexico. The way a drought presents itself is the first thing you lose is the rainfall. The second thing you lose is the surface water, and the final thing you lose is your groundwater as those water tables start to decline. Our rainfall is down at incredibly low levels. In fact, the low at the southeast corner of the state, where most of this hydraulic fracturing is going on, it's a highly water consumptive in industry. The southeast corner of the state has had a combined 13, almost 14 inches of rain in two years. They're at about 50% of normal rainfall <coughs> where this water is being consumed. So how much water is being consumed by fracking? I think you had Peggy Johnson up here from New Mexico Tech, is that right? Giving a testimony on how much uh, water consumption per well. Uh, it comes out right now, it's actually drastically on the rise. From 2011, there were about a half a million gallons per well used in fracking. 2012, that number rose to 830,000 gallons per well. So we're not only fracturing more wells every year, the water intensity of these frac jobs is also going up. Um, another thing to consider on water consumption is about every five years you have to refract these wells. Again, we're in the dying age of natural gas. I mean, we don't have gusher wells anymore. We don't have shallow water. You know, we don't have deep water. You know, the deep water has gotten awfully, awfully dangerous through the, the deep water horizon disaster you've seen. Now we're at the point where we have to pound water at tens of thousands of horsepower down holes in hydraulic fractures and keep fracking them over and over, using toxic chemicals to get the last <laughs> dying gas of oil and gas out of the ground. This is the end game. And uh, the importance of moving to another uh, technology is, is becoming severe. So the total water consumption, um, the total water consumption I have for 2012 was 518 million gallons. Added to 2011, you're at about seven or 800 million gallons. You're talking about a significant amount of water, again, growing every year. And as you have to, five years down the road, when you have to refract all these wells, those number, numbers start to double. So you quickly get into billions, I can't even say the word, billions with a B, gallons of water that will be used, fresh water, that will be used for hydraulic fracking in a few years. So that's number two is, uh, is um, water consumption. So we have spills, contamination, water consumption. The third thing I want to draw your attention to, I did put out a graph of uh, of climate change, that, or a couple of things that are happening as a result of climate change. This is these two declining graphs here. It's been 15 years since I've been in front of a legislative committee in New Mexico and presented climate change data. So this graph is primarily to show you that I haven't learned anything in 15 years. I'm going to come back in here one more time with a climate change graph. This, this top graph, and none of this requires, by the way, that you believe that climate change is anthropogenic. It doesn't matter why it's occurring. This is actual data. The top one is sea ice volume in the Arctic 
the issue of sea ice in the Arctic is when that ice goes away, you no longer have the reflectivity, and that sunlight goes into the ocean and warms the ocean further. So scientists believe that when the summer Arctic ice is gone, you now have a warming effect, a natural warming effect. It's not even anthropogenic anymore. You have a natural warming from the sun that exceeds the warming of anything we're doing with oil and gas consumption and burning. So at some point, the important thing to know about the climate is there is a checkmate scenario in which it looks like you still have moons regarding windmills and solar panels, anything you want to do, but it is too late. In other words, it, climate change is a natural phenomenon. All we're doing is changing the atmosphere a little bit and setting it off. And once it's set off and that ball is in motion, that ball is rolling down a hill and there's no way to stop it. So the belief is that that ball is rolling when the summer ice goes to zero. You can see my projection on that curve going down to zero. This is, this is in, uh, in, in the year 2019. So we're about six years away, I believe, from the checkmate scenario in which there's absolutely nothing that can be done about it. The very late stages of dealing with a very critical problem. You hear a lot that um, climate scientists don't know what they're talking about, and that's this bottom graph is an example of that. It's true they don't uh, know with any certainty what's going on. This graph shows you that uncertainty cuts both ways. Um, the blue curve on the bottom here is showing you what in 2007 was believed to be the rate at which Arctic ice would be going away, and the red curve is the rate that the Arctic ice is actually going away based on satellite measurements. So we are currently losing the Arctic ice at a rate much, much faster than any of the climate models predicted in 2007. So those of you who believe that the climate scientists don't know what they're talking about, you're absolutely right. It's just that we're 60 years ahead of schedule on losing the Arctic ice. Um, a couple of things. All oil and gas production and burning leads to climate change, leads to releasing these, these gases into the atmosphere. But even worse than, than releasing the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning these fuels, if you leak the methane into the atmosphere, it is, according to one study, 105 times worse on a per mass basis than leaking the carbon dioxide. So now you're into issues of does hydraulic fracturing increase the rate at which methane comes up out of the ground? And there are some terrifying studies. Uh, on the, soft, the softer rock formations around Wyoming, on the hydraulic fracturing, opening fracture paths directly from the hydrocarbon basin, the methane basins, and releasing that methane directly to the atmosphere. Absolutely terrifying. Uh, it's also been shown that about 6% of all wells uh, have a failure of the outermost uh, bonding layer. You know that you shoot cement, you drill into these formations, you put a steel casing down there, and then you shoot cement into the gap. In about 6% of the cases, and this is study after study, you do not get a good bond between the cement and the rock formation, allowing the methane again to bubble up. You've seen it, you've seen these pictures of it bubbling up in streams, but it doesn't have to be in a stream, it's bubbling up everywhere. So every time you drill an oil and gas well, every time you drill 100 oil and gas wells, about 6 of them, 6% of them, are leaking uh, the underground gases directly into the atmosphere. That's, there are several studies to demonstrate. By the, by the way, the leakage rate goes up over time. That's also been shown. An extensive study done by the EPA in the Gulf of Mexico shows that the number rises from 6% of methane leakage, met of wells leaking methane, to about 60% over a 30 year period. So, again, we're drilling tens of thousands nationwide, hundreds of thousands of wells. Uh, a large percentage of them are leaking methane over time. It's, a, it's just a dangerous, dirty business. Um, the last graph I want to take you to is, um, is this one with the blue curve and the red curve. This is, I want to talk about economics as the, as the fifth reason <coughs> that we should get our stake off of oil and gas, and you know, it's incredible that we do so. I mean, incredibly imperative that we do so. This top graph shows New Mexico oil and gas production since the year 1970. You can see we had an early peak around 72, and then we had the, the largest peak of, of natural gas production in the state was around 2001. The important thing to take away on this is uh, the price of natural gas was still rising through about, what, 2007? Peaked around 2007, I think. So as the price was still skyrocketing between 2001 and 2007, why weren't we drilling more wells and why weren't we producing an increased amount of gas? Uh, the answer is we were drilling more wells, we just weren't producing more gas. 
every well produces less than the one before it. That's the nature of decline of a resource. You cannot just expect that you continue punching holes in the ground to get more and more gas. I've written some numbers down in here next to the curve as it's declining on the right-hand side. Our production is down about 31 percent since 2001. But those curves show you how many wells were drilled year on year. The top number there are 1,035. When you drill 1,035 wells and the next year's production falls, you're in the end game. When you drill 856 new wells a year after that and the production falls again, you're in the end game. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new wells and the decline of the basins is so severe now in gas that there is no way to turn that production around, I don't believe. I don't know what it would take to turn that production around. Uh, the bottom curve is New Mexico oil production, 1970 to 2012. Uh, this curve, a slightly different story. You can see that we've been in decline, a general declining trend since 1970. That's been pretty much happening. Uh, 1970 was the peak of oil production for the entire U.S., so we weren't alone in our declining oil fields. But now you see something different happening in the lower right-hand corner. Through the drilling of hundreds and thousands of wells per year, we have been able to increase our oil production. Thank goodness for the state coffers that both the cost of oil is high and, uh, and we've been able to increase our production over those last five years. We've done it through heavy, heavy use of hydraulic fracturing. Again, you know, if we had gusher wells, we wouldn't be fracturing. If we had onshore uh, shallow wells, we wouldn't be fracturing. If we had uh, shallow gulf wells, we wouldn't be fracturing. We are in the end game where we have to inject many, many toxic chemicals into the ground in order to bring up the last gasp of petroleum and fossil fuels. Um, I have one more thing. Uh, I'm sorry that this one's an eye chart. There's so much information on it. Uh, I just passed this one out, brought this one in this morning. These are, when you talk about, okay, you know, you're the expert and all these things have been going on, but what does hydraulic fracturing have to do with it? The point is, when you spill these fluids, they are far more toxic. And this is what's been going on. I only compiled the data from the spills database. Again, this is New Mexico Oil Conservation. This is only data compiled from 2011. I didn't have time to do 2012, I assure you. It's on the same level. In fact, 2012 had record spills, the record year for spills. Um, you can see some of the reasons in the comments that these spills occurred. These were all spills involving fracking fluids. Um, the top one, frac, uh, you see in the top right hand uh, comment section about on frac tank leaks. Below that, release of 214 barrels of acid in fresh water, nipple broke off the bottom of the acid truck. The next one is a faulty blow out protector, uh, valve malfunction on the frac tank. There's a couple down here if you go back, uh, that small one, that very narrow one in Eddy County. Release of 10 barrels of produced water, that's actually fracking fluid. That was actually flow back, not produced water. The reason was the flow back hand fell asleep while they were flowing back the well. And that happened twice in the year 2011. There are also trucks running over frac tanks. There are frac tanks corroding, leaking uh, fluid out the bottom of them uh, into the groundwater. So again, some very seriously toxic chemicals. We're talking about these processes and procedures moving into our pristine agricultural lands. And that really, really can't be done. Uh, we have to prevent that, and uh, as I know as a matter of economics, we need to allow it in the two basins for now, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a good idea to allow it to encroach in the center of the state. Um, I'm going to wrap it up pretty much with that, but in conclusion, um, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, I want to provide a little bit of respect because I've been studying the energy industry for a long, long time. Uh, in 1923, an engineer from Standard Oil convinced the Surgeon General that it would be safe to put a known neurotoxin into gasoline and blended in gasoline. And that was allowed for about 65 years. And over that time, some 68 million American children were exposed to toxic levels of lead. And about 325,000 Americans, according to the EPA, lost their lives through uh, lead toxicity from allowing lead in gasoline. In 1970, the US Electric Utilities convinced the US Environmental Protection Agency that coal-fired power plants provided no threat to public health. And ever since then, subsequent studies, uh, statistical analyses have shown that coal-fired power plants and the, the, the presence of particulate pollution they put out kills about 30,000 Americans annually. The number now in the latest studies is still about 13,000 Americans annually lose their lives from exposure to particulates of coal-fired power. Again, they were given an exemption to the Clean Air Act based on saying that it was safe to public health. In 2005, the oil and gas industry convinced Congress 
that slip water hydraulic fracturing was so safe it didn't need to be subjected to the enforcement of, or should be exempted from the enforcement of the Safe Drinking Water Act. I believe that slip water fracturing is the third, is going to be in this line, is going to be the greatest environmental disaster of our times. I believe that the, the effect of injecting highly toxic chemicals into the ground by the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of gallons is going to prove to be over time worse than these other two, uh, these other two decisions we've made combined. That, that's my perspective on the industry and, and where it's going and, and what's going on. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd be delighted to answer questions from the community. Great, thank you. Uh, Kent, if you want to do the response. Mr. Chairman, though, and you're welcome to you pull up your chair and, and, and Mark, if you could just slide over a little and let right there is fine. You know, and we do have, I think this is your handout. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Kent Cravens, registered lobbyist for the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association. I really appreciate uh, being able to come and, and uh, share uh, our thoughts with you on this on this very important issue. Uh, I, I want to just thank you for the opportunity to uh, to have a, a reasonable dialogue, yeah. uh, and, and Senator, for uh, allowing us this opportunity. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I just want to start by saying um, the uh, New Mexico Constitution, Article 20, uh, Section 21, is pollution control, uh, states that the protection of the state's beautiful and healthful environment is hereby de 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 declared to be of fundamental importance to the public interest, health, safety, and general wealth, welfare. The legislature shall provide for control of pollution and control of despoilment of the air, water, and other natural resources of the state, consistent with the use and development. Now, this is the part that I want you to pay a little attention to. Consistent with the use and development of these resources for maximum benefit of the people. So what, what that's telling us is, is that it is the legislature's responsibility uh, to balance these things, not only for uh, pollution control, but for the maximum beneficial use of the resources. Uh, and then you get into split estates and things that, uh, that are constitutional uh, protections uh, with property rights and things like that. So it is a very delicate balance and it's a very, uh, very difficult thing for you all to be in charge of managing. So my hat's off to you for taking control of it. Um, but if you will turn to our little handout here. I, I just wanted to provide I, that. <laughs> all, the, all the committee members get one. Um, it, it is a source of, of major revenue and major employment for our state. Over 30,000 directly attributed jobs to oil and gas uh, in New Mexico. Uh, these are 30,000 high paying jobs, much much higher paying than the average New Mexican job. Uh, so it is a, it is part of the economic fabric of our state. Uh, and again, the, the trick is how do you balance all of those things together? Increasing access to domestic sources of oil and natural gas would create new and high paying jobs, bring billions of dollars of, to the federal and state uh, treasuries, reduce our balance of payments, and enhance America's energy security. <clears throat> and the reality is, Mr. Mr. Chairman and members, is that the, uh, the growth in, in renewable sources of energy, what the so-called renewable sources of energy, uh, doesn't even keep pace with the uh, growth in demand. Um, and so uh, we, we find ourselves in a predicament of being more and more dependent on fossil fuels and not less dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, so. Um, Next, next sheet real quickly, just the economic impact of oil and natural gas uh, in, in New Mexico. And these are just things that you can, you know, take home if you like and read. I, I think I, I gave you a thicker packet earlier in the week that, that had some more information. But um, New Mexico is blessed. In the, in the third slide here, New Mexico is really blessed to be uh, one of the states where, where we have the benefit of having a, a revenue source like, like the oil and gas industry. A lot of states, uh, you can see uh, Arizona is very little, Nevada is almost none, Seattle uh, or the Washington area, um, Oregon, Idaho, uh, you know, there's some states, Florida doesn't have very much. So we're really blessed to have this opportunity. Uh, and again, the trip for you is to balance those, those blessings and, and whatever, uh, whatever mitigation of, of risk might come with that. 
Uh, New Mexico's uh, natural gas production, uh, to be honest with you, uh, the prices have been down for a while. And so uh, the gas production has been down. Um, and there, there aren't very many rigs running in, uh, in north, northwestern New Mexico at this point. And it's not likely to be until, until the pricing structure changes. And so uh, that, that moves us into the next one, uh, oil production. And it obviously is up. Uh, the price is up. The, the industry is healthy in, in the southeast part of the state. And, uh, and, and, and continues to, um, to be good. Uh, the next sheet, I think you may have seen it before, is just a chart of New Mexico's revenues from oil and gas, where they come from and where they go. It suffices to say it's probably 30 to 35 percent uh, of the state's overall economic pit or, or revenue picture it is directly attributed to oil and gas production. Um, and, and again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, not, not that any of these things are the right way, the wrong way. Uh, let's, just, let's just balance with fact what, what's going on. Our energy forecast, um, volume and price on the next slide. Um, the history and, and, and the forecast moving forward. Uh, oil volume, it, it continues to rise. I, I uh, would disagree with the, uh, with the uh, sponsor's expert witness on that. Uh, as far as declining basin, um, he's right. There is no more bubbling crude. Never has really been in New Mexico. Since uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but there there are vast uh, resources uh, and and you know we've had companies come to New Mexico uh, and, and be very very happy with uh, with the discovery that what what they thought was a declining basin in a Permian area turns turns out to be because of technology uh, a very healthy uh, uh, basin. In, in terms of what it can, is producing and can produce in the future. Um, the, the next little slide here is uh, third quarter uh, earnings by industry. I know oil and gas gets pegged as, as making all the money. Um, it's, it's really not true. It, it, it just By industry, it tells you that the oil and gas, the, 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 the percentage of income per dollar of sales it is, is in the lower half. Uh, it's, it's certainly not anywhere near beverage and tobacco, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, electric equipment. And, and I just wanted to point that out because we, we do take a, uh, a, a rap for being excessively profitable, and, and, and the industry is just not. There's an excessive amount of risk uh, in producing oil and gas to fulfill uh, America's uh, hunger and, and thirst for, for clean, affordable energy. Uh, there's a, a huge capital investment associated with producing um, these, uh, these, these raw materials to, to be turned into refined goods. Um, and just about everything you touch and everywhere you look, uh, if, if you didn't truck it in using oil and natural gas, uh, somehow it was made uh, in some sort of a process with, with oil or natural gas. So it is so prolific in our society, it's, it's, it's almost virtually impossible to see a society that doesn't depend on oil and gas. Um, the next slide is, is just a little bit about groundwater protection. And I know in New Mexico, you know, my, my grandfather was a dry land bean farmer in the, in the Estancia Basin. And um, he used to tell me when we were growing up, you know, you, you think the guy with all the gold is rich until you meet the guy with all the water. And, and that's, that's the words that he lived by his whole life. And he's absolutely right. So. As the grandson of a dry land bean farmer, I can tell you I'm, I'm pretty sensitive uh, to, to protection of the water as well, as are the 30,000 employees that work with <laughs> the New Mexico oil and gas uh, industry and their families. So the way they do protect the, the water, and, and New Mexico is blessed in another way, and that is our geology supports very deep, um, uh, very deep target zones with, with many, many layers of geologic time between the surface water and that target zone. Uh, is, is it a situation where there's never going to be a spill, never going to be an accident? Absolutely not. We, we know that, that, that there is, is, is inherent risk. But again, the constitutional provision uh, that I cited earlier, that, that's up to you all to decide. So basically, here's, here's how uh, it's done, is uh, through, through well casing design, and well board design and construction, uh, there is a series of, of uh, three, four strings of uh, cement and pipe and cement and pipe 
down through the aquifer to protect that aquifer. These, uh, these are, are all very highly regulated processes. They're very well detailed. The engineers spend <coughs> enormous amounts of time making sure they get it right. Uh, the bond logs where, where the cement and the rock bind together <coughs> to protect uh, the, the production tubing, uh, those bond logs are checked routinely. Uh, again, um, is, is it a perfect system? Um, nothing in this world is, is a perfect system, but we have to balance, again, the risk and, and the benefit to society. So, you know, down 8,000, 6,000, sometimes 10 or 12,000 feet below the surface with all these impermeable layers of, of, um, of, of geologic time, uh, you have the production zone where you see, in this particular case, 6,000 feet below the surface, and these fissures that are created by the hydraulic fracturing process will extend somewhere between 30 and usually maybe no more than about 100 feet beyond the wellbore. And they're microscopic fissures, and uh, I'll get into the construction of frac fluid in just a second, but um, the, the idea that they could, they could cause seismic activity, are, that, that's, that's been absolutely proven to be a fallacy. The next slide is just kind of a blow up of the wellbore design. Uh, again, highly regulated by the OCD. On the next slide, we do talk about frac fluid. 99.5% of fraction fluids are comprised of uh, fresh water. Now, let me indicate to you, too, that, that uh, the industry is moving away from fresh water and they're moving towards using other uh, mediums for transfer of, of sand into the target zone. Uh, nitrogen. CO2, um, different, uh, even produced water, believe it or not, produced water and recycled fracturing water, the industry has a real incentive to make sure those technologies are advanced and advanced quickly because it's a financial burden to go out and buy a, a, a dollar barrel of, of water, fresh water for a frag job, and have to pay $3 to get it to the site. So they're, let me tell you, they've got a real incentive to go ahead and and advance this technology where they can use produced water, recycled water, reclaimed water, uh, and other other mediums uh, like nitrogen and CO2. Um, what, what's in what's in it? Here's a list of, you know, most generally uh, what's in frac fluid: 99.5% sand and water, uh, less than less than a half a percent of uh, additives, uh, and they are chemicals. Um, you know, chemicals are. All, all over, um, styrofoam cup, a paper cup, uh, coffee, uh, everything is, has got a chemical structure to it. And so when we say chemicals, we've we got to just make, make sure to keep it in perspective. So that's, you know, the fluid situation. That's what hydraulic fracturing fluid is made of. Um, the, next, the next sheet is uh, just to, sh to show you uh, an MSDS sheet on a particular um, product here called uh, Inflow 250W. It, it lists the hazardous components. It also lists surfactants as proprietary. Does that mean that it's a, a totally well-guarded secret? No, because there's a 1-800 number right above that, and if there's a first responder incident, and if somebody is exposed to not only the harmful chemicals but the surfactants in that product, there's a 1-800 number right there in the, in the, um, uh, from the um, Chemtrek, and, and a first responder would be able to get immediate access to uh, either antidotes or whatever might be needed uh, to help relieve whatever problem might be caused. Um, so that's you know, the MSDS sheet. Uh, the Mexico Oil and Gas Association two years ago asked the, ne the Mexico Oil Conservation Commission for hearings on full disclosure of fracturing fluids. So the next sheet, you will see the sheet that we actually submit uh, during a job, during a fracturing job, to the OCD so they can keep stats and, and compile this data. Uh, and it was it was the Oil and Gas Association's initiative for full disclosure. And I'll try to be brief, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know you've got a long agenda, and I, it's going to be a long day regardless. Um, so just that, that there's there's a lot being done in New Mexico. And, and the other way New Mexico is blessed, not just because of the geology of, of, of where we live and things are, are, are very, very deep. Uh, we're, we're not fracking in, in uh, uh, zones where 
where water and, and, and methane gas are naturally occurring together. Uh, we just don't do that in New Mexico. It's not economic. Uh, those wells are not, uh, we're, we're drilling deep, eight, six, eight, ten thousand feet, and, and trying to keep more or less a closed loop system between those things. Uh, fracturing and surface spills. Uh, surface spills are, are accidents uh, in, in the field. And, and it's, it's always unfortunate to have an accident, but you can't really, you can't really, I mean, it's apples and oranges when you start talking about uh, uh, accidents and spills, whatever it might be. And, and just to be consistent with the argument, um, you know, there's about 700,000 single wall uh, gas tanks uh, being driven around uh, every day. And, and to be consistent with the argument, that's in, it, in and of itself a hazard. When you walk down that aisle in the grocery store and all the outgassing from the chemicals in, in the cleaning aisle, and I would submit to you too that the surface spills uh, and, and a, a, a fracturing job, the difference between the two is, you know, gravity takes those surface spills and pulls them down. Uh, and we've got millions of septic tanks, probably, uh, in, in, the, in the United States that are susceptible to whatever somebody might want to flush down their toilet or pour down the drain. And um, a lot of people really are, are not too sensitive about what they put down in their septic tank. And, and that, I would submit to you, is much more uh, of a problem uh, to, to surface water, groundwater, than, than a hydraulic fracturing job that's eight or 10,000 feet below the surface. So, um, end days, I, I, don't, I don't really agree with the, the, the fact that these are end days. Because of technology, we're, we're, we're just seeing a, a resurgence of oil and gas production in, in our country. And a, and a resurgence that, you know, uh, if and when renewables uh, really play a major role, uh, which they don't right now, um, we, we have we have to have it, uh, and, and we're finding ways that the earth uh, can can give it up. And um, spills, again, we we covered that a little bit. Uh, you've got you've got the problem with leases, um, the split estates in New Mexico, where the um, uh, surface owner may not be the mineral owner. Uh, how, how, how these leases are written and how this gets put together is also another level of protection where uh, owners and mineral leasers can get together beforehand, before there's ever a spud, and, and get together and talk about what the end game is going to be. What's this going to look like? How's this going to go? And how's it going to affect the surface? And the Surface Owner Protection Act is a pretty tight law uh, on surface owner's rights. So, you know, we've, we've, we've been through that a lot of times. Water consumption, let me just talk about that briefly. There's 4 million acre feet of water used in New Mexico for various uses. Agriculture, ranching, um, um, industrial, uh, manufacturing, and then, of course, our, our own personal use at home, which is the, the, the minor end of the scale, is, is personal use of water. Um, the big users are agriculture, obviously, and, and manufacturing. Uh, of the 4 million acre feet of water consumed in New Mexico, 14,000 acre feet uh, in the last year were consumed by uh, hydraulic fracturing. That's less than, less than four tenths of 1% of the total water usage. And again, I would add that we're moving away from freshwater solutions just because it's economically viable if we can figure out how to make it work. Uh, to, to be able to save water and reclaim water and reuse water uh, and crack jobs and produce water. Uh, I know that Halliburton in Pennsylvania has, uh, has many, many operations where they're doing this successfully. And it's all about the downhole chemistry and the, and the caustic nature of the target zone itself and how to, uh, how to, uh, to cause the well board to be a lower pressure and, and, and fluids to migrate through those rocks down there. It's not like you're drilling into a pool <coughs> down below. You're drilling into something that's similar to a sidewalk and causing microscopic fissures held open with grains of sand to cause the fluids to move from the rock to the well board. It's all about pressure. So um, just just a bit a bit about water consumption. Uh, do, doing everything, uh, the industry is doing a lot to be able to, to, to use less uh, and to be more uh, appreciative of, of the water. Um, I've, I've also got a, uh, I've got so many articles and things I could give you. I, um, I guess I probably would stand for questions at this point, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, be happy to try and sit through some of this. 
No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, Senator Sewell's you, your willingness to have uh, Mr. Cravens here present the other side. Just for the folks in the audience, because this is the first bill we've really had that deals in this committee with the fracking issue, and so I do think what we've tried to do is is have an educational component and hear, hear both sides, uh, and that's why we did it in this manner. I do. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll certainly go out to the audience. What I'd like to do first is just get a show of hands for those in support of Senator Sewell's bill. Okay. Uh, and then let's get a show of hands for those who are in opposition. Okay. What we're going to, uh, as I stated right up front, what, what, what I'd like to do, and, I, and I've spoken to you know, both sides and the advocates on both sides, is to have five on each side. Uh, speak and you know try and keep your comments to two or three minutes. But and, and, and understand if it's been said, you know, then then pass it along and let someone on the other side uh, speak. So let's let's start first with five who would like to speak in support of the bill. And Eleanor, yeah, if you could coordinate, that'd be great. Leiner, please. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lee Einer. I'm from Las Vegas, New Mexico. I am, amongst other things, certified in hazardous waste uh, operations and emergency response. And I strongly support the bill. And I may be running a little bit long here because I had hoped to simply share some information, but it seems like I have to debunk some misinformation as well. Uh, put this in perspective, we have a three-minute rule when we talk about uh, hazardous chemicals, okay? The three-minute rule is you can make it three minutes without air. You can live three days without water. You can make it three weeks without food. We've made it as a species 160,000 years thus far without fracking. We need to understand that. So when you weigh these two, please weigh it accordingly. Now, when we talk about uh, chemicals, and there's chemicals and everything. It's true. Salt's a chemical. It's great in your pasola. A tablespoonful of it. A uh, tablespoonful of cyanide, not so much. So we need to be aware of dose response issues. Okay, when we talk about the specific chemicals that are being used to crack uh, benzene, toluene, uh, ethyl benzene, methyl benzene, methyl ethyl benzene, dimethyl ethyl benzene, um, and th these are a handful out of more than a thousand that have been identified. And some of these, most of these, have levels of toxicity that can be measured in parts per billion. Okay? That means a handful of molecules floating around in a cubic meter of air, a cubic meter of water, exceeds the safe threshold. It's a problem. Once you put them into the water, once you put them into the air, they're there. Right? Uh, it takes a huge amount of water, fracking water, to frack. That's been covered. I'm not going to go over it again. But what we really haven't talked about is once you put those chemicals in that water, you didn't just use that water. You now have a million gallons plus of toxic water. You transformed it from a vital need for human survival to uh, something that kind of goes in the opposite direction. It's a, it's a biohazard that needs to be somehow safely disposed of. And you really can't treat it effectively. Uh, some of these chemicals, particularly the volatile organics, can dissolve the filters in reverse osmosis. Okay, So you can't really use reverse osmosis to clean the water up. You just, you're kind of stuck with it. What the industry has done is they put it in open pits to reduce the volume and they let, let uh, these chemicals evaporate out. You know from high school chemistry that the stuff at the lowest boiling point is going to go out first, and that's the stuff like the benzene, which means that now it's not just polluted water, now it's polluted air. And it's polluted with some toxic stuff. We're talking about chemicals that are teratogens, meaning that if you happen to be pregnant and you're exposed, you have just endangered your fetus. Okay? We're talking about mutagens in some cases, that cause chromosomal damage. We're talking about carcinogens that expose you to a risk of cancer. We're talking about neurotoxins, benzene being a great example of something that will cause irreversible damage to your nervous system. And when you put it in the water, 
It ain't coming out. Particularly when you put it in the water, you pump it in the ground, and you somehow screw your aquifer. <coughs> it's done. It's not getting undone. Okay? So, where's the balance? Make a little money. Destroy the things that you depend on for survival. Uh, it's not 50-50. It's not 50-50 at all. When we talk about the technology, you know, uh, Mr. Sardella was very astute in pointing out that this is not the fracking we've done since 1947. This is really the fracking we've done since perhaps 2003, 2005. <coughs> okay? So we say, well, you know, the wells are proven to have a 6% failure rate. That's, that's a good thing to go on provisionally. But realistically, what we have to say is that we know two kinds of wells with respect to the new fracking. We know the ones that have failed and the ones that have not failed yet. So okay. just, if I could, we're at three minutes, so just begin to wind it up because I want to give everyone else a chance to speak. All right. Yep. I'm going to try and keep it then short. These wells fail. Yes, they have steel casings. Obviously, you don't have a continuous steel casing that goes down three miles below surface. These are made with joints. The joints leak. These are encased in cement. But when the toxins are down there, they need to be contained down there as long as there are people. Uh, how many of you, show of hands, have seen, we're talking about cement, have seen a sidewalk more than 30 years old with no cracks? Yeah, I'm not seeing a big response there. Okay? What we're talking about is not safe, has not been tested, and objectively cannot at this time be proven safe. This is why a number of countries have banned fracking completely. This is why several states have already stood up and banned fracking on the state level. And this is why we need to ban fracking in New Mexico. We don't have enough water to screw up, and it is not right to endanger the health and safety of our Thank citizens. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Consuel. you. My name is Consuelo Luz. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm a singer, songwriter, a teacher, and a gardener. Um, in the great beloved tradition of the New Mexico Corrido, I'm going to start out. Vienen a robar nuestra agua, decimos, no, no, no. This is a tune composed by Amy Winehouse, a beloved singer who succumbed to the poison of alcohol because she refused to go to rehab. No, no, no. We are addicted. We are addicts in the society to the things that are killing us. And this is one of them, including the fossil fuel industry as a whole. The chemicals in what we're doing to ourselves is an abomination to our planet and to humanity. We are also succumbing to another poison, corruption. The corruption of our political and economic system that is destroying life on planet Earth and the future for our children and our grandchildren. We are addicts and we need to detox. And it's tough to detox, I know, because I have family members who have detoxed. And we need to have whatever it is, uh, FA, Fracking Anonymous, FFA, Fossil Fuel Anonymous, <laughs> because we are killing ourselves. <clears throat> So, well, I'm, I, I just came up with this sitting here. Um, so I'll just, the rest of it I'm just going to say and take that Amy Winehouse song. This is addressed to the fracking industry and those who support them. You come to take our water, we say, no, no, no. We, you come to pollute our land, we say, no, no, no. We come to release more methane, we say, no, no, no. You come to foul our air, we say no, no, no. You come to cause more greenhouse gases, we say no, no, no. You come to kill our future, we say no, no, no. You come to rob our children, we say no, no, no. You come to block alternate energy systems, we say no, no, no. You come to block low water consumptive systems, we say no, no, no. You come to kill the planet, we say no, no, no. Vienen a matar la tierra, decimos no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, my name's Gail Giles, and some of you have known me. I came here from Fort Worth, Texas. I moved there in 2006, not knowing anything about the Barnett Shale. Within two years, there were hundreds of wells all over uh, the city of Fort Worth, Plano, all over the place. I mean, only a couple of municipalities said no over a period of time. This gentleman has given us some interesting information from the oil and gas industry, but he's talked about what's happening to the groundwater. He hasn't even talked about what's happening with the venting of the wells, especially when you're talking urban and semi-rural areas of the venting of these wells, which they would normally do at 4 in the morning, so we didn't know what happened. I'm a pretty healthy person, and I like to leave my windows open there in the early spring and summer, and I found I had to start closing them because I was getting ill and finding out what was going on was some of the vapors they're showing in Fort Worth, Dallas area that the increase in asthma and uh, the repercussions with a the EPA on um, the toxins in the air had increased substantially over the last few years just from the venting of these gas wells. This gentleman also talked about balancing consistency of use of resources with health and safety. So we have to balance the benefit over a risk. We've already seen what's happened in my beloved Gulf of New Mexico where I can no longer eat the fish because it's been destroyed by the oil and gas industry. We've seen what's happened in oil and gas industry and Ecuador and Bolivia and other areas where they are rebutting these huge multi-million and billion dollar um, um, uh, settlements where they don't want to pay the money and they don't want to spend the money to make sure this is safe. We cannot be taking these type of toxic chemicals which are going into the water and it doesn't matter how much water it uses if we don't have it. What happens with the water, uh, even if we do dry fracking, even if we do any other kind of fracking, the damage to the water that we have, even if we don't use any water whatsoever, is water that we don't have to spend. We're talking about benzene and chemicals. Uh, this gentleman was mentioning, and a one-half percent of additives. Well, we're talking about one-half a percent of addi additives significantly affecting millions and millions of gallons of water is what we're talking about. For about the number of wells we have, we're talking billions of gallons for each time they frack a well one time. I want you to look at this picture that you have and imagine this, which is what I saw in schoolyards next to schools um, all over Fort Worth, Texas, where I live. This is not something that you want every place that you're looking at. I noticed that Mayor Moncrief of Fort Worth, Dallas area didn't want to have one in his neighborhood of Forest Hills, but he wanted one in my neighborhood. And I just have to say, I stood there with um, as the poster child for Fort Worth against a woman named Mrs. Horton who lived in her neighborhood for 70 years. She was close to 90. They wanted to eminent domain her street, take down 200-year-old oaks and elms, they wanted to basically take away her wheelchair access so they could put, we're not talking small two and three inch gas pipes, we're talking 16 inch pipes right yeah, 10 feet from the front three, door. We're at three minutes, just so you know. I so I take... want you to understand what this is in relation if this happens in urban areas in, San, in Santa Fe, in uh, Galisteo Basin, and what this is going to do to affect areas that are more uh, not remote rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman, Senators representing the state of New Mexico and the people of New Mexico taking an oath to act in the public interest and the public good. I am for this bill, Senate Bill 4, uh, 547. And just introduce yourself yes. for the record. Miguel Pacheco, I come from San Miguel County, and in San Miguel County, we from Las Vegas, we've been in a water shortage for several years. We, we cannot water plants, we cannot have a garden outside, we cannot water our trees. No one has grass. Uh, just like the rest of New Mexico, we're all in drought. Water is uh, our life support, one of the most precious uh, elements we have for our life support. Earth, air, and water are the three constituents that we need to survive. And it appears that there's certain industries have uh, an unfair advantage over the citizens. So what I'm saying now is that uh, our water supplies have been uh, tainted by the oil and gas industry. These proprietary chemicals that aren't even being allowed to be dispersed towards health officials, etc. There are like 14 state uh, states in the union that are uh, disclosure laws. But I talked to OCD 
and I asked what happens if I get fall into a pit or get exposed to chemicals, and they say there's no remedy for that. Uh, uh, the industry does not have to disclose those chemicals. Uh, it, a lawsuit would have to take place before those chemicals would be, be uh, disclosed. Now, what happens to all this fracking fluid after they use it? They, they can't pump it all back up. You know, when they go for, through these imp uh, impermeable layers, they've compromised every layer now. Um, they try to pump up what they can, and they put them in holding pits. Uh, and there's discussion now whether these, whether a, a little plastic lining pit is too much of a burden on the oil and gas industry when they're, what, $138 billion last year. So we're going through that as we speak. Uh, where do they, how do they dispose of all these toxic chemicals? Uh, they can put them in a holding pit. They can try to vaporize them, and what's been brought up, they go into our air again, we breathe them in, or they put them into injection wells. And in injection wells, they dump them into low uh, aquifers that are brine. Uh, our brine, uh, I think our brine water is going to be our savior. We have the intelligence to figure out that that saline water there is 